Hello, everybody. Welcome again to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast. This is Dr. Casey Patrick, and joining me today on this episode is one of our in-charge paramedics, Wesley Hall. Good morning, Doc. And a lot of our best episodes, we've talked about this before, come from those hallway conversations. And it was probably two or three weeks ago, and Wes was walking through the office and said, hey, Doc, I got a cool case. And it indeed was a really amazing case. Uh, it stemmed from some questions that Wes had actually sent Dr. Dixon and I related to some protocols that we'll get to. Uh, we've got some video that we'll link on the uh, podcast show notes so you guys can take a look at some de-identified shots from the case. So it really is a full circle case that involved care here in the county, one of our in-charge medics here with clinical questions made me think and when we got to that point we said hey i'll bet everybody else would like to hear about this too um so let's not give it away too much here in the intro wes how did the call come out what were your thoughts en route let's start there yeah sure so uh, my normal partner and i were headed back from the hospital we had just dropped off a patient and uh, we were talking about that call when another one popped up on the computer there in the truck uh, it came out once the notes all populated in. It just came out as a priority three, so non-emergency back pain. Uh, and it was an elderly person, elderly female with back pain for three days. So typical type call that we get almost every day, if, at least once a tour probably. Um, so <coughs> we were talking on the way to the call and you know, it's, what could it be? You know, maybe a chronic back pain that's flared up and exacerbation. <coughs> or uh, kidney stones, UTI, maybe a trauma or a fall. Those are probably the most common things we get. Um, of course, in the back of our heads, we're thinking, you know, of course, this one would be like a big MI or something, something crazy to check, but we'll see whenever we get there and go through our questioning. So that's, I mean, that's really a, a point number one is that this came out as run of the mill. And I always, when talking to the medics, make it clear that, you know, by trade, I'm an emergency physician, I'm not a paramedic, but one of the things that's similar about your job and my job is that run-of-the-mill back pain is is a part of our world mm -hmm. and so you know even in those back pain patients we have to make a differential and you thought about you know acute on chronic radiculopathy sciatica kidney stone maybe trauma fall with contusion or a compression fracture i mean it's not that you didn't go down the list but there was nothing that was terribly alarm bell sounding about this case from the call notes or from you know your dispatch determinant or anything like that so you arrive on scene obviously the tables are going to turn at some point or we wouldn't be talking about this case right. on the podcast so when did your antenna start to perk up when did you start to sense that maybe this wasn't acute on chronic or a contusion or a strain right so we had fire department first responders running with us and they got on scene first um, and yours really pinned back once we heard some of the history, which I'll get to in a second. But, um, you know, walking into the house, uh, you know, the patient was already standing up, walking around the house and, you know, you look sick or not sick. The patient really didn't look really that sick. You know, across the room, there was no respiratory distress, weren't clutching chest back, uh, you know, skin was pink and warm and dry. And I'm like, okay, well, what's going on? And uh, she says, well, my back's kind of hurting. And this was kind of a very typical case of a patient trying to play off their symptoms because uh, she was like well I've been working in the yard ER the last few days and I think I just strained something in my back because my back's been hurt for a few days I'm like okay well you start going through the history and uh, whenever you see some of the things pop up you're like well maybe this isn't just a strained muscle or something from working in the yard so that's a and I'm, let's take that as point two we'll, we'll dive off a bit and talk about the concept of premature closure and if you went into this case and you said this is going to be a non-acute, non-emergent, benign condition, and you let her guide you without asking a few more questions, you could have easily said strain, working in the yard, patient looks well, no big deal, let's go to the hospital, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I would say in my practice, I've done that more times than I could count. And the idea of premature closure is that you hear the diagnosis or the answer that you want to hear, the differential, the result that creates an ending, a closing for 
what's easiest for you. Ah, this is just a strain. Let's go, ma'am. Um, and so you run with that without doing the rest of your exam, without doing the rest of your history, without talking to family, without looking at the med list, those sort of things. And so kudos to y'all for asking a couple more questions because you eventually got to some history and some physical exam findings that change your course. Talk about those. Yeah, absolutely. So the fire department did a really good job before we got there getting a history and getting a set of, you know, or getting a list of medications, stuff like that. So we worked off of what they got. Um, so the patient had a history of hypertension, uh, uncontrolled. I, asked, I started asking questions about it and I said, are you on any medications? And he said, no, I used to be, or she said, I used to be on medications, you know, metropolol, low starting a handful, but they, I didn't like the way they made me feel. So I just stopped taking them. So I said, so you're not on anything right now. You just quit taking your medications. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, okay, that makes sense because your blood pressure is up in the 230s. So probably, probably not the best. And then I said, you know, the firefighters here said you mentioned a history of aneurysm. I was like, where's that aneurysm? And she said, well, it's an aortic aneurysm. I was like, okay, well, this definitely isn't, <laughs> this very well could not be a kidney stone or a back, st back sprain. So she was already walking towards us. So I said, well, go ahead and sit on the stretcher here. Let's get some vitals. Um, check blood pressures in both arms. Uh, they were off about 15 to 20 points left to right. I can't remember which one was uh, more hypertensive, but there was a difference. Heart rate was fine. It was in the 70s. Sats were fine. Uh, like I said, respirators were fine. Lungs were clear, all that kind of stuff. Uh, radial pulses were good in both arms. So I said, let's get out of the heat. Let's just go into the truck to kind of do a more focused secondary exam. So while I'm getting a 12 lead, my partner's getting an IV. Um, and again, I go through, I'm going through history at that point, getting temperatures, sugars, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I start going through a more physical exam and already had the shirt unbuttoned doing the 12 lead. So I'm like, well, let me, let me feel your stomach real quick. So I press lightly and uh, I really didn't have to feel it as I, much as I could uh, look and see the hand pulsing with, with the abdomen. That's just, you know, now your deal is, is more sealed. Let's back up a little bit because you hit some points and some exam slash vital sign specifics that I want to address for the listeners. And this is, I wouldn't call it a pet peeve of mine, but I feel like when we use certain terminology, sometimes words get mixed up. We've talked about this delineation, differentiation on the podcast before. And that is when we talk about the concept of aortic disease in general and Aortic diseases are, they're, they're, they're multiple. Uh, the, the big ones that we think about when we talk about emergent chest pain and emergent abdominal pain, though, are two different pathologies, two different, you know, pathophysiologies, two different really anatomic emergencies. And when you talk about upper extremity blood pressures, we're thinking more about thoracic aortic dissection, tear in the wall of the aorta and when that happens if that blocks outflow of our vessels coming off the aortic arch then we can have unequal blood pressures in the upper extremities and so if your blood pressure is 220 210 200 and you've got a 15 uh, millimeter of mercury difference you're under really under 10 percent there so probably not uh, something that would ring an alarm bell worth checking and watching we know that you can have thoracic aortic dissection and not have unequal blood pressure so it doesn't rule anything in or out but i definitely would put that on my list of things to consider now you moved caudally moved southbound and you looked at her abdomen you barely palpated her abdomen and it was bounding like a bass drum and you knew then your diagnosis you knew that this wasn't a thoracic dissection this was a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm or a triple a and triple a pathology triple a risk factors are a little bit different than thoracic aortic dissection risk factors and we'll come back to those uh, in a bit when we talk about you know some of the some of the basics but at that point now you've got a you've got a patient with elevated blood pressure you've got what's for all intents and purposes, a time sensitive emergency, a vascular emergency. So you've gone from, you know, 180 degree swing from I was working in the yard and my back hurt a little bit to 
no, this is more than that. So where did your mind go at that point? What decisions did you make acutely? And kind of describe to the listeners where your mind progression went from that point when you saw her bounding, you know, pulsatile abdomen um, kind of into the ED. Take it, take it that route, the next probably five to 10 minutes. Sure. So, you know, let's just say that maybe this even was that she did have a kidney center UTI that really wasn't the concern at that point. You can have two things at once, but I'm like, all right, so we have a hypertension an already diagnosed AAA years ago. And it, she was diagnosed four years ago and hadn't had any treatment, hadn't had any follow up from it. So we don't know how big this thing is. Um, so we already have a AAA, we have hypertension, back pain, radiating into the abdomen and a very large pulsatile mass. Um, this is probably what we're looking at. We did a 12 lead to make sure there wasn't any sort of MI. So at this point, we've checked all the things that we can check and we know kind of, okay, this is, like you said, a time sensitive emergency. So we had an IV established. Uh, the patient you know, said she was in 10 out of 10 pain. So I'm like, all right, well, let's get some fentanyl on board, which, you know, a drip fentanyl confirmed with my partner. He hopped up front while I was administrating it. And I said, just go ahead and run us in lights and sirens. Uh, just get us there. We weren't too far from the hospital, but red lights and traffic, you know, we can get there at least a little bit sooner because with that pressure, I wouldn't want that thing to rupture uh, before we could at least be inside the hospital. So, um, yeah, we gave fentanyl for pain management uh, during transport, and then we started our uh, secondary assessment and talking to the patient on the way there. Talk a little bit about your pre-hospital notification because this was a, a, a stellar move from my standpoint because when we talk about pre-hospital alerts in, you know, EMS care, it's reserved almost exclusively 99.99% of the time for STEMIs, for strokes, for traumas. You know, some of us have sepsis alerts. Some folks delineate between a stroke alert and a elvo or a large vessel occlusion alert, but really stroke, STEMI, trauma, plus or minus sepsis, you know, cardiac arrest really kind of falls into that STEMI cardiac arrest. We don't really think about a AAA alert. That's not one that we do very often, but Tell the listeners your mindset on, you know, how you prepared your report and sort of how that tied into the nurse reception when you got to the hospital, because that was an interesting piece of the story for me. Sure. So uh, we use an app on our iPad to alert the hospital. We don't do radio communications anymore. Um, so and then there's a box in there that we can free type kind of what the chief complaint is and any uh, pertinent findings. So. I'm pretty sure the first thing I put in the uh, free text box was possible AAA diagnosed hypertensive, you know, non-controlled, and then we put the rest of the vitals in there. So just put it straight out what I think it is and maybe perk their ears up a little bit to somebody look at it and be like, oh, my God, somebody's coming in with a AAA. But what did the nurse say? Yeah, I walked in and walked up to the nurse and I was like, hey, I got your AAA here. And she's like, well, how do you know it's a AAA? I was like, well, because of X, Y, Z. Uh, told me they had one and uh, you can see their belly bounding so and the doc was there correct mm -hmm. at that by that time it sounds like the doc's ears perked maybe even quicker than the nurses so you guys went straight to straight to cat scan straight to cat scan didn't take very many images to figure out what this uh patient had she had a enormous check the link in the show notes uh triple a so what the doc do what, what were the next steps from because you were there for the scan you were there for sort of the the uh, the next steps in this case, thankfully, I thought that was a, a really awesome piece for y'all to get to see. What did what did she do? Yeah, so we took the patient to CT and they did a CT without contrast first and then a CTA right afterwards. And we didn't even have to get to the CTA and the ER doctor was already on the phone with radiology calling vascular surgery uh, for one of the downtown hospitals uh, to get this patient in. So talk to radiology, talk to vascular surgery. Who was third on that list? The, sur the surgeon surgeon yeah. and then and then helicopter yeah. correct yeah For so sure. so in the span that we were there before we even you know and for almost all vascular emergencies we want iv contrast to rule out active extravasation or active bleeding and this patient eventually got that but the lesion was so large that we didn't even need the iv contrast to see it which which can happen and so in the time span that we've given report taking this patient to cat scan Wes is in his, Wes and his partner hear the emergency doc talk with radiology talk with the vascular surgeon and talk with a helicopter crew 
for transfer from Montgomery County down to the med center. A lot of these complex vascular cases uh, sometimes can be cared for here in the county. Sometimes uh, these are complex enough to require, you know, really quaternary care type uh, situations. And here in Houston, that's the med center. Big, gigantic, enormous, uh, dangerous, life-threatening AAA. Excellent recognition and management by, you know, really kudos to the fire crew as well for, you know, digging that piece up for you. This is, uh, we'll talk about therapeutic momentum in a bit, but this is truly a case of multiple spots where therapeutic momentum uh, worked in this patient's favor and for, a, for an excellent outcome. So I'm going to pause for a second from the case, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some AAA basics and address the question originally that you sent Dr. Dixon uh, uh, via email, because it was a good question. All good questions require a Google search. So I had to dig a little bit, some MRAP, some some textbooks, some vascular surgery recommendations uh, to get there. But let's back up and let's talk about abdominal aortic aneurysms in general. Uh, an aneurysm is a bulge in the wall of uh, an artery. Abdominal aorta being where these occur. Um, all three layers of the artery are involved in a true aneurysm. The intima, the media, the adventitia. The normal aorta is approximately two centimeters in diameter anything greater than three centimeters is a triple a most that rupture are greater than five centimeters i'll give you the end of the story and the uh the punchline. uh this uh triple a in wes's case was uh greater than 11 centimeters 11.4 or something like that i'm not sure i've ever seen an 11 centimeter triple a so you now sir at the podcast table hold the record for the largest triple a that you've taken care of so i'll get you a trophy or something for that classic presentation of triple a is really exactly like this oftentimes back pain uh, flank pain radiates to the abdomen um, radiates sometimes you know flank to back these can definitely be confused with renal stones throughout my training from really from medical school to emergency medicine residency uh, there's been an oral board or an oral case or a test question on almost every exam that I've ever taken that presents an elderly patient like this one uh, in their 60s or in their 70s with flank pain radiating to the back and the the catch is trying to fool you into a premature closure on a kidney stone diagnosis in this one we could have prematurely closed on trauma strain kidney stone lots of things because she did what a lot of patients do and that is they don't want to worry you know they want to minimize their symptoms because they don't want to have emergencies patients don't think like us we think what could the worst possible thing be that's our job we're downers at parties we're negative nellies that's 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 what we get uh trained to do and patients are the exact opposite they don't want it to be bad they don't want it to be an emergency they want it to be indigestion they don't want it to be a heart attack they want it to be a strain in their back not their triple a that they've tucked under the rug and decided to stick their head in the sand over and hey listen i'm not knocking patients there's lots of chronic medical things that i know i need to take care of that sometimes i don't do the best job of so that's just human nature um why do we get this confusion with triple a's and kidney stones well the anatomy really helps us out uh, the kidneys are retroperitoneal they're not in the peritoneal cavity uh, most of the abdominal aorta is also retroperitoneal so that sort of radiation to the flank and to the back is pretty common because they're both retroperitoneal structures you can have pain from a triple a without rupture so as that triple a enlarges that pain can can come without rupture so that's a possibility in this case this triple a had ruptured but thankfully it was a retroperitoneal rupture and the retroperitoneal space is much more tight and closed and has the ability to tamponade than the intraperitoneal space so these are contained ruptures is the term that's used versus free rupture. 
So a free rupture of this 11 centimeter plus AAA would have allowed all of that, all of her blood volume to spill into the abdominal cavity, much more open, can contain liters and liters of blood. So those are the patients that have really seconds to minutes and then oftentimes exsanguinate and die versus this situation where it ruptured posteriorly into the retroperitoneum, caused that back pain, that kidney stone-like pain, and did bleed, but it bled into an enclosed space. Luckily, she tamponade physiology uh, occurred and was stable enough to last for repair. Who do these form in? They form in folks with vascular disease, in vascular pass, people with atherosclerosis, hypertensive. Uh, if you remember Wes's initial blood pressure was high. I'm on losartan and metoprolol and hydrochlorothiazide and clonidine and insert all the blood pressure medications that she's not taking, uh, diabetics, smokers. So really the patients that you would be worried about coronary artery disease and MIN, that's your AAA patient, your vascular pass. About one to two percent of patients, 50 to 80, will have a AAA. So it's not terribly uncommon. Um, ruptured free ruptured triple a's have a 90 percent mortality so this lady was very lucky very lucky. very lucky definitely hanging by a proverbial thread so that's just some just some background into triple a's let's let's take into some of the ems considerations and get to to wes's question um and before we get to the question you know this is one where I think folks could say like, well, we gave some fentanyl and there's not really much for us to do here from an EMS standpoint. And I would argue that is absolutely false. You know, our IV access in this case, we had good IV access. Did you get one or two? Uh, just one. You know, if I want to be picky, I would say, you know, this is a patient. If I see a bounding uh, belly, I'm probably looking for two or three, you know, um, just because Massive transfusion could theoretically be on the horizon. Um, you know, monitoring mental status is key uh, as far as, you know, the, the kicker for hemorrhagic shock from my standpoint is, you know, can the patient mentate? That's, you know, the brain's getting uh, perfused. That's a pretty good sign that everything else is probably hanging in there. A thorough exam was, was vital here for you because I don't know that it changed where you were going to go you would probably have found the bounding belly that's going to be pretty hard to miss but what really gets you to even doing an abdominal exam in the first place is thinking about what it could be besides a strain if you walk up and you close on she was working in her garden you may even palpate her back a little bit uh, she's walking so you know that her spinal cord is not compromised for the most part i mean it'd been pretty easy to put her on the stretcher not gotten a 12 lead and moved on without an abdominal exam but thinking about aortic pathology, you did bilateral upper extremity pressures. You took a look at her abdomen. When we were in the hallway talking about this, you also mentioned her legs. What did you do when you looked at her legs? Yeah, so on the way to the hospital, kind of during my secondary exam, I took off shoes, socks, and checked pedal pulses and kind of the perfusion in the legs, but they were still pink, warm, and dry. Sometimes, of course, you know, you get that aortic aneurysm you lose some perfusion and you get some shock-like symptoms down low but she didn't have any of that yeah and we group these aortic disease states oftentimes we think of thoracic dissection and triple a being the only aortic diseases but aortic thrombus and an emboli exist in this realm of aortic diseases and so if you have a, a you know abdominal aortic thrombus or you know a big embolus that can cause dead legs or a dead leg, depending on whether it's iliac or, or aortic. And so thinking about temperature, color, pulses, cap refill, that really is a, um, that's an astute exam thought. And to be able to report to me when you hand that over in the ER, hey, I'm worried about a AAA, but we've also got dead looking legs. You know, that may change. Am I going to do, am I going to do an abdominal CT with contrast? Am I going to do a CT angiogram with lower extremity runoff, uh, it may change my orders. So there definitely is some therapeutic momentum there that can affect the imaging choice that I make. Um, you know, the question that you asked, and honestly, I had my answer, but I wasn't confident in my answer. I wanted to back it up a little bit, was should we have addressed the blood pressure? 
that's that's how this email string and this conversation this is where the podcast came from was Wes said hey we had a blood pressure of 220 I thought it was a triple A what should I have done basically and then my question was how in the world did you know it was a triple A did the patient come with an outpatient scan did the patient come from a from an outpatient radiology clinic those are all the things when I thought through it and no it was just some really good clinical history taking by y'all and the firefighters history of this uncontrolled hypertension and I could see it on my exam which is not super common right so tuck this one away because this may be a career case for you um it's an excellent question because we talk about end organ damage and hypertensive crisis a lot the aorta is an end organ in a sense but we're not talking about a dissection and with aortic dissections we we definitely want to acutely lower blood pressure and dissections present classically with ripping tearing chest pain that radiates into the abdomen this wasn't this picture this was a this was triple a and my answer really fell back on first do no harm and my clinical take would be if i had this patient and they were mentating and they had a potential to exsanguinate and hemorrhage i would not want to put a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker on board our option on the trucks here at mchd would have been labetalol mm -hmm. um, we also carry esmolol not for that indication um, but that would be an emergency department option as well so a couple but, different beta blockers which i believe is what they i think they did esmolol and cardine and yep ER. cardine would have been the other so why would you do esmolol over labetalol um, and that is because Esmolol is more selective than labetalol and uh, quite a bit shorter acting. So in other words, if you look over and the patient is pale and altered and you think, oh, snap, it's ruptured, then you turn it off and the esmolol is off. Labetalol hangs out a little longer. It has some other receptor affinity. So esmolol is cleaner and quicker. Cardine really is much uh, in the same vein as esmolol. It's a calcium channel blocker, very quick on quick off as well um, so it's if you see signs of hypoperfusion or exsanguination snap that thing off and you're done um, but it got me to looking you know and there's really no evidence-based answer um, there's no solid vascular surgery recommendations and in fact the recommendations that I found were uh, quite vague almost as vague as my answer to you and my answer to Wes really was I wouldn't touch the blood pressure off the bat I would be concerned about it because I can't imagine that 230 is is good for the wall of that aneurysm but I would really want to balance that with the recommendations of my vascular surgeon who's going to be taking care of that patient so I would have a quick phone call to that person and say hey what do you think do we need cardine? Do we need esmolol? Do we need both? What do you recommend? Knowing that I would want to address it, but I wouldn't address it without a subspecialist consultation. Uh, I found some recommendations um, from uh, the Vascular S Surgery Academy that we'll link in the show notes that are similar. Uh, I listened to some background information on MRAP as well. If you're familiar with MRAP, it's probably the preeminent emergency medicine podcast, and it almost said the same thing no clear answer no evidence-based answer likely indicated in consultation with your subspecialist so my thought in the end is you know it's probably a bad idea to give beta blockers or calcium channel blockers if there's a potential to exsanguinate without having consultant uh, recommendations on board so i think not treating it in that situation was the right move deferring that to the ed doc who's on six phones one of those being the vascular surgeons was a, was a good move addressing the pain you know fentanyl short acting uh minimal histamine release less hypotension that you would get with with morphine was was the right answer what happens when we get to the ed so those were the ems considerations for wes and his partner and our first responders what do i do when i get these patients and honestly it's been a while since i've had a triple a we talk a lot about them uh, i don't see them terribly often in the ed uh, a lot of these are you know folks that we find dead on scene because when they free rupture like with the 90 percent mortality we only see 10 percent of those that rupture um, ct is the gold standard 
for uh, diagnosis, so Wes saw that with his own eyes. There is a role for point of care ultrasound to get a quick initial look at AAAs, but they're really not great at seeing rupture. The sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing AAA rupture is poor. Don't wait or don't bank on hypotension because it can be late. Uh, there's a triad with AAA, and as with all triads, they're uncommon clinically. Uh, abdominal mass, low blood pressure, and back pain, and having all three of those is rare. We had an abdominal mass. Two out of three. We have back pain, but high blood pressure instead of low, so I guess that's Kind of like the meatloaf song, two out of three is not bad. Um, you want to avoid intubation at all possible. These are uh, hemodynamically unstable folks. That makes sense. Uh, goal systolic, probably somewhere around 100. Um, there is even some discussion and some thought that therapeutic um, hypotension, permissive hypotension may not be bad in these patients. There's not a ton of evidence base for that. That's really more of an um, expert opinion. Uh, really, I would guide by mental status and by urine output. Um, if ruptured, the survival rate decreases 1% every minute after ED arrival. So the truly a time-sensitive emergency, the earlier the ED can know, the better for the patient's outcome. So this is one where therapeutic momentum wins for us. This no, Them knowing when you rolled through the door that that belly was bounding and it's she had a history of AAA that led them straight to the CT scanner. If you had closed, said, not done an abdominal exam, let's just say the shirt was buttoned, you didn't look, and you rolled in with the blood pressure of 190 after the fentanyl, came down a little bit because the patient felt a little better, and you said, I've got a 68-year-old lady here with abdominal and back pain for a couple days. She's been working in the yard and you know, feels like it hurts when she bends over. Blood pressure's a little on the high side, but she's not been taking her blood pressure medicine. She was walking. She looked real good for me. Where do you think that patient could have went, especially in today's world? Uh, we probably would have gone just to a regular room, and I think they were about to put us in a regular room before the doctor came over, and I kind of gave the full history, and she said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and and I would argue that in some spots where I work today, that could have even been a waiting room patient, mm -hmm. which would have been a collapse, exsanguination, and waiting room death. So therapeutic momentum, diagnostic momentum, you teeing that patient up for the ED. And you may say, well, we, we gave a little fentanyl, doc. We didn't, we didn't do a, an intubation. You know, we didn't do defibrillation. We didn't do a needle finger thoracostomy. This was just as impactful and just as life-saving, if not more, than those procedures. So kudos to you, your partner, the fire crews on this case. Just really excellent. So we're up against 30 minutes. We don't like to go too much longer than that. So Thank you, Wes, for joining us. I'm going to wrap it up. So history and physical, while sometimes seemingly the end of what we do, the last piece may be boring, they really can be mined for gold. In this case, you hit, you hit Eureka for sure. Rapid transport and early notification are for more than CVAs, STEMIs, traumas, cardiac arrests. This is one where an early notification and lights and sirens were absolutely indicated and potentially likely impacted this patient's outcome. AAA is a time sensitive emergency, especially when they're ruptured, whether that's free rupture or contained. Once you arrive, your mortality decreases 1% per minute after ED arrival. Think of the anatomy, think of the physiology that'll guide you to how this presentation happens. It's a retroperitoneal organ. It's going to act like a kidney stone. What are your risk factors? Well, the physiology is no different than a left main or a uh, uh, LAD lesion, so hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, advanced age. Uh, there's no indication for BP lowering in the EMS setting for AAA, but being aware of that and passing on that information is absolutely vital. If we know it's ruptured in the ED, we may tolerate some lower blood pressures. Uh, we're going to monitor mental status and we're going to really make those discrete changes, those, those really delicate changes with a vascular surgeon's recommendation on board, Esmolol, Cardine, those are uh, probably going to be the prime two, either or or both that we would use, uh, but definitely not going to make those decisions on my own as an emergency physician. So 
Again, Wes, thanks for joining us. Thanks for everybody out there watching on YouTube, listening, wherever you get your podcast. Please follow us. If you're not following us, uh, subscribe. YouTube, subscribe. Uh, iTunes, Google Play Store, SoundCloud, wherever you listen. Leave us a like or a review as long as it's five stars. Otherwise, you might hurt my feelings, and I'm a sensitive guy. So leave us a like or a review. We like, uh, we like your input. We try to reply to everyone. As always, if you have ideas, podcast at mchd-tx.org. And thank you all for listening. It's, uh, we're approaching 200 episodes, and it's cool to keep doing this. Glad to have Wes on. Thanks for joining us and bringing us this, bringing us this awesome case and awesome questions. Uh, we'll be back with another episode soon. Have a great rest of your day.